Genesis chapter 27, that's where our main focus will be. But let's pray first and then go to it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this morning, for the renewal of your grace in our lives. And we pray that through the Holy Spirit, you will open our hearts and minds, that we will be able to see clearly the deep things that you have in your word. Reveal those things to us in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessing and uh, blessing again. That is the topic this morning. Before reading some uh, passages from Genesis 27, I would need you to go to Genesis 26. What we are trying to see is uh, this entire story of Isaac passing on the blessing, the Abrahamic blessing, reluctantly or unwillingly, to the son that was indicated by God. So, as you remember from the story, we saw it last time, in order to receive the blessing of the firstborn, Jacob, held by his mother, tricked his brother, deceived his father, and uh, supplanting the one that was biologically the firstborn, he got the blessing of the firstborn. But the story of the blessing comes all the way from the time of Abraham. Abraham being the grandfather of Jacob, the father of Isaac. Remember, we had moments in the Abrahamic story when uh, we were thinking, well, maybe Lot, maybe Eliezer, maybe Ishmael will inherit the Abrahamic covenant. But God always intervenes somehow, straighten things out, and in the end, we have a confirmation of the fact that indeed Isaac is the heir. And Abraham gives in, so to speak, and in the end accepts what God wants him to do. We have that episode on uh, Mount Moriah. We see Isaac on the altar and uh, the father ready to take his life. Well, actually, this is the position. This is only in art. The right position is close to the neck. And finally, we see that there is a ram in the thicket that changes the whole story. And instead of Isaac being sacrificed, somebody takes his place. And uh, Jesus Christ, in a symbol, is sacrificed there. But then, of course, Abraham dies. The blessing is passed on to his son. And uh, we have in chapter 26 a very interesting structure in which before and after that episode of Isaac lying about who his wife is, saying uh, she's my uh, sister, God appears to Isaac before and after. So the structure in 26 is this, God, God, and here Isaac messes up. But I would like us to look at those two interventions of God. So in chapter 26, verse 2 says, 
Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. And then it goes on. God continues to speak to Isaac. Please notice that in his intervention, God reminds Isaac that he is going to perform the oath which he swore to whom? To Abraham. Abraham is mentioned by name in verse 5 again because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So twice the name of Abraham is emphasized. Okay, then go to the other intervention after Isaac lies about uh, Rebekah. 24, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. Please notice again, twice the name of Abraham is emphasized. And the way Abraham's name is emphasized, it gives us the impression that all that God is doing here is because of Abraham. Forget about Isaac. First, we are told in verse 5, because Abraham obeyed, right? And then in 24, I am the God of your father Abraham, for my servant Abraham's sake. It seems that everything happens because of Abraham. Now, the time comes for Isaac to pass on the Abrahamic covenant to his son. Which son? Of course, his favorite, we know it from last time, is Esau. But we also know that God spoke to Rebekah in a divine revelation before they were even born. They were fighting in her womb. And uh, God told Rebekah, the younger will rule over the older, or the older will serve the younger. So there's a reverse order here. Does Isaac like that? Not really. Because when the time comes for him to go, just like his father Abraham passed, and before he passed away, he wanted to clarify things. He wanted to make sure everybody knows who the heir is, who inherits the covenant, the covenantal blessing, and uh, the promises that come with it. Isaac as well wants to clarify some things. And in chapter 27, we see that Isaac, old and blind, calls his son Esau to give him the blessing. So he's not happy about the reversed order that God decided. Now, something interesting can be seen in uh, the way the blessing story is given. The text is structured in a way that points straight to the blessing. And you have that, the blessing of Jacob in your worksheet, the first chiastic structure there. It looks like this. And here you have the blessing. Okay, so let's just read a little bit through it and see what happens. 
you have the two ends of that chiasm in which the focus is Esau's wives. Esau's wives are a pain, a trouble for his parents. They bring bitterness to Isaac and Rebekah. And that is emphasized both here and here. Then as we go closer to the middle section, we see that uh, Isaac asks Esau to bring him a game, the food prepared from a game, and he would receive the firstborn blessing. At the same time, we are told that Rebekah tells Jacob what she heard and comes up with a plan. If you jump to the other end, point B, you will see that Esau actually does bring the game, that is the food prepared from the game, and he does receive a blessing. But that blessing is not the firstborn blessing. And again, Rebekah tells Jacob what she heard. And again, has a plan, an escape plan for Jacob. So, again, you have this and this. Point C speaks about Jacob coming in the presence of Isaac, his father. On the other side, you have Jacob going out from the presence of Isaac, his father. Indeed, Isaac blessed Jacob. And on the other side again, we are told that Isaac finished blessing Jacob. So the focal point is the blessing itself. Let me read the blessing for you. Isaac blessed Jacob with the firstborn blessing. Surely the smell of my son, who's the son? In his mind is Esau. In reality is Jacob. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Curse be everyone who curses you and Blessed be those who bless you. Let me ask you, what kind of blessing is this? Is this the Abrahamic blessing? It's not? I understand your answer. It doesn't look like that. Although some elements clearly are from the Abrahamic blessing. Because... It was told to Abraham, curse be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. And if you go back to the Abrahamic blessing, you will see that some features indeed are found here. But this is the firstborn blessing. And Isaac is obviously confused. When God came and spoke to him here and here, in both interventions, twice, here and here, God speaks to Isaac about Abraham. Abraham. When Isaac blesses the firstborn, which is in his mind Esau, but in reality Jacob, he never mentions Abraham. Is there a reason why? Well, we'll probably see something later. But keep that question in mind. 
Why is it that Isaac, when he passes on the blessing of the firstborn, which actually should be the Abrahamic blessing, only that God reversed the order of uh, the two sons, Esau and Jacob, he never mentions Abraham. But then the text goes on, and uh, we have another blessing. Esau receives, he does receive a blessing. And that is described in Genesis 27 between verses 30 and 40. And on your worksheet, it is the second little chiasm. But this chiasm looks somewhat different. You have a clear construction, and you can analyze that construction. I will not go into detail. But please notice that the focal point of that little chiasm is not the blessing. It's something else. Let me read the focal point. Genesis 27, 37. I have made him your master. That is whom? Jacob to Esau. I have made him your master. All his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? So you have this structure, but here you don't have the blessing of Esau. You have the confirmation that it's Jacob that already has the firstborn blessing. And the blessing of Esau comes here. Look at it. Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And please notice that the same two elements are mentioned in Jacob's blessing. So Esau's blessing is somewhat similar to Jacob's. The two elements, fatness and dew, appear in both blessings. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now that's a pretty strong prophetic insight with regard to the future because it gives you a sense that God knows what is going to happen in history, that Esau will fight off the rulership of his brother Jacob. So, again, the focus is here, Jacob, and the blessing is on the side. Let's move one step further. There's a little structure there, a little chiasm, that points to the character of Jacob. And I mentioned this last time as well. The focal point of that little chiasm is verse 36 in chapter 27, which says, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. What would be the answer to that question? Is Jacob rightly named Jacob? Of course. He did what he did. He supplanted Esau twice. He is a supplanter. He is a deceiver. But the story goes on. With all the bitterness, all the cry, all the tension that is happening in the story. In the end, you know, Rebecca comes up with that escape plan. And because she knows she cannot carry that plan out alone, she goes to Isaac and uses the challenge, the problem of uh, Esau's wives. And she says, if Jacob is going to take a wife 
from among these pagans? Why should I live? And Isaac does something very interesting. And now please notice carefully because we have, before Jacob leaves, we have another chiasm in which there is a blessing again right here. And that is at the beginning of chapter 28. It says, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of of whom? Oh, it's like Isaac woke up and now he knows what blessing he gives to whom. And then it goes on. To you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to whom? Abraham. Again, twice. Abraham is mentioned twice. Have we seen Abraham being mentioned twice before? Of course. Look, here Abraham is mentioned twice when God speaks to Isaac. And here again Abraham is mentioned twice when he receives the word from God, when Isaac receives the word from God. So, what is happening here? Well, the text seems to indicate that Isaac knew what his responsibility would have been, whom he should have blessed with the blessing that comes from Abraham. He knew that. And he knew Esau was not supposed to receive the Abrahamic blessing, the covenantal blessing that was by God's decision given to Jacob. And yet, he wanted to do something like 50-50. He wanted to bless his favorite son, would never mention Abraham's name, and he could probably think maybe somehow later I will bless Jacob as well and somehow 50-50 both will be blessed and everything will be fine. It's a human way of solving difficult situations, dilemmas. After the bitterness of uh, the disappointment when Jacob supplants Esau, and then Esau comes and cries, and then Esau wants to kill Jacob, and Jacob has to leave. It seems that Isaac comes back to all his senses and gives in and says, okay, it's time now for me to really bless Jacob the way I should have blessed him when I first blessed him thinking that it was Esau. And at this point, he really mentions Abraham's name twice, just the way God did it when he spoke to him twice, here and here. But there is something weird happening later in the Bible, and I would like to read that to you. Malachi chapter 1, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have, what's the word? 
hated. Huh. That sounds pretty strong. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. This is God speaking. And if you go to the New Testament in Romans chapter 9, Romans 9, this same verse is reiterated in uh, verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. How's that? So that sounds very strange to modern and postmodern minds. Let me read something else from the Gospels. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Again, the use of the word hate is very strange here, isn't it? So do you have to hate your family so that you can uh, follow Jesus Christ? And another verse, Matthew 10, verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So how do we understand this that in order to follow Jesus, somebody has to hate his family, her family? If you look at what uh, verse 37 says in Matthew 10, then the idea is he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So this concept of I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. What is that about? You know, there is something that is called in linguistics an idiom. What is an idiom? Or idiomatic expression. What is that? For instance, when I say, let me just cut to the chase. What am I cutting and what chase is that? What does that mean? Okay, let me be brutally honest. But I didn't say that. I said, let me just cut to the chase. So that's how an idiom functions. You have some words that come across with some specific, somewhat different meanings than the words themselves. Something similar happens with uh, this expression in the Bible when God says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. 
the meaning of this expression seems to be idiomatic and uh, it seems to mean I chose Jacob over Esau. I chose Jacob over Esau. Just like in the case of a follower of a Christ, because I'm a follower of Christ, I choose Christ over my family. Does that indeed mean that I will mistreat my family, I will go against my family, I will manifest hatred against my family? Is that the meaning? No. Was that the meaning for Esau when God chose Jacob over Esau? No. How do I know that's not the meaning? So it has to be a, an idiomatic expression? Because after Jacob was blessed, and then also Esau was blessed, and Jacob had to run away and became a rich man, and then he comes back to Canaan. He returns home. We will see it next time. There's a moment when the two brothers, the one that was loved and the one that was hated, or the one that was chosen over the other, they have a confrontation. And the supplanter, the guy that uh, tricked him and uh, took away his uh, birthright first and then the blessing of the firstborn, he wants to give a big gift to bribe his brother Esau. You remember what Esau tells him? I don't need that, my brother. I have plenty of everything. Which means that Esau indeed was a rich guy. Somebody that could have an army to march with and uh, face his brother was indeed a blessed guy. So we cannot say that God hated him in that sense. This idiom, this expression, which is very hard to translate into modern English or any other modern language, this is the meaning. I chose Jacob for this purpose over Esau. Questions? The question is, what is the original meaning of the word hated? Because you have a contrast, obviously. One I loved, the other one I hated. There are plenty of other contexts in the Old Testament in which the word translated there by hated is indeed hated. But the meaning of the word when it appears in an idiomatic expression is somewhat altered. So it doesn't come across with the same strength because when we hear with the modern mind, hate, I hate this, then we, we think about something very cruel, very nasty, uh, abusive or aggressive at least. You can hear that in movies, when somebody that uh, was in love with somebody else, all of a sudden they come and say, I hate you. And to us, that's the meaning of the word. And indeed, there are contexts in the Old Testament when the meaning is that. It's a very strong, emphatic, almost aggressive attitude towards somebody. But in this context, proved by the gospel verses that I quoted, Luke 14 and Matthew 20, where the discussion is between following Jesus or following the desires of your family, clearly indicates to me 
at least. But again, I don't want to explain the text away. The text is love and hate. That's the text. But the reason I'm taking it as an idiomatic expression is because I have this New Testament evidence as well, which is in Greek, so it's not Hebrew, it's a Greek usage of the same Hebrew way of thinking about the word love and hate. Because in Luke chapter 14, the idea is, if somebody puts his family, mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter, before Jesus Christ, then we have a problem there. So the expression in the New Testament is, if somebody does not hate this and that and this and that and this and that, including his own life, which is practically a concept of abnegation, self-abandonment. Because the right order of priority is Jesus Christ and then all those. If you are in a situation when you have to decide, am I going to follow Jesus here? Or am I going to follow my close relative? Then the right way to go about it is follow Jesus and allow him to straighten out the whole situation. Absolutely. So the question is, when you read in the Bible, God speaking to his people, God speaking to Moses, for instance, and God uh, telling him, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Is there a meaning there? Of course there is, because it is a way of establishing who God is. Or, if you want, which of the gods Elohim or Yahweh is. Because in those days, we are dealing with a polytheistic world, which means that people are worshipping all kinds of gods. Take, take, for instance, the context of Egypt. You have all the pantheon of Egyptian gods and goddesses. And there you have a people that uh, has been in bondage for centuries, 400 plus years. And all of a sudden, a guy in a desert called Moses has a theophany Theophany means God appears to him. And you know the burning bush story? The bush was a natural bush, but the burning in the bush was supernatural. It was God's presence there. So then God somehow identifies himself and tells Moses, Hey, I am the one I am. Some translations say, uh, Probably somewhat better translation would be, I am the one that is, meaning without past, without present, without future. It's a continuum. It's not like the existence of humans where we have a past, a present, and then we have a future. No, God exists. He is. He is Elohim. That's why, for instance, when they translated the Bible into French, God is translated with Eternal, the everlasting. That's how Yahweh is translated. What we have in the, the English Bibles, the Lord in the French Bible is eternal. But to make it specific, that people understand who God is, God sometimes refers back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because in that time, oral tradition clearly set Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the trio with which the people of Israel started. Because Israel is, we will see next time, the other name of Jacob. So it's an identification purpose that the Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob serves. Correct? Thank you for that observation. Indeed, if you analyze chapter 27 and the first part of 28, you can clearly see how in spite of human brokenness and this human thing when we want to run ahead of God, we want to fix it for Him. I don't know how God would have worked it out had they not intervened the way they have. God has His ways. Somehow, God would have worked it out to place Jacob where he wanted him to be and then to have Esau in the place where he wanted Esau to be, choosing Jacob over Esau. That's the concept. God, for sure, he had a plan for that. But it is part of humanness, and uh, I think we have to watch ourselves and uh, correct this human tendency by God's grace of running ahead, fixing it for him, helping him out, making sure his plans will not fail. And yet, in spite of human brokenness, when people go astray, when people act up, when people divert things and mess things up big time, God does not just throw them away, abandon them, but God tries to bring them back, straighten them out, and He has His pedagogical ways. You will see next time how this guy, the supplanter, the deceiver, later on has to face himself, practically, in the distorted character of his father-in-law, Laban. Because if Jacob was a trickster, Laban was the trickster. He knew he had a school for that. How to fool him, how to just have him do his ways. And it hit home for Jacob when instead of marrying the love of his life, he ends up a polygamous guy, having four wives instead of one. Now that's painful. But sometimes God allows our character deformations to be reflected back and even take some pain, some heat, some hit out of it. So the question is, did Isaac live long after he did the blessing, the blessings, because he blessed Jacob unwillingly, and then he blessed Esau, and finally blessed Jacob knowingly when he leaves. So the question is, after that moment, did Isaac live long? I'm not sure we have how many years he lived. Have you found how many years he lived? Genesis 35, verse 28. Okay, good, good, good. So we have, we have indeed uh, the age. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. 180. So that means he lived five years longer than his father Abraham. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people being old and full of days, same description like in the case of Abraham. So then the question would be, if we have the age of his death, how old was he when the blessing happened? If you can find something 
that uh, helps you make the calculations, then uh, we could probably have that answer. What is emphasized in uh, chapter 27 is that he was old, when Isaac was old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. And in verse 2, it says, Below now, I am old, I do not know the day of my death. Which kind of tells me he was preparing for the passing. But I will do my research and uh, try to find if there is an answer to that. If we can calculate out of the age of his death to see what the age was or approximately what the age was when he did the blessings. When we are speaking about thwarting God's plans, are we referring here primarily to Isaac? Because it seems that both Isaac and Rebekah were privy to God's plan from the beginning. The text does not clarify that. If you go to chapter 25, it says in verse 20, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, and it describes her origin. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So at this point, Praying for Rebecca because of her infertility, we see Isaac in action. He is the one praying. But then the children struggle together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. She went to inquire of the Lord. Isaac is not mentioned here. And the Lord said to her, and then we have that prophetic prediction of the future of the two, how one will serve the other in reversed order. However, what we've seen today is that the way Isaac blesses Esau in his mind, but actually Jacob, kind of indicates that he knew, he knew what the divine plan was. And he wanted to do the 50-50, you know, do what God wants, but also do what I would like to do. Because in this blessing here, when he first blesses Jacob, thinking he was Esau, he doesn't mention Abraham's name. It's like he has amnesia and uh, he forgot what kind of blessing that blessing should be. Because if in his mind he was blessing Esau, he clearly knew Esau would not receive the Abrahamic blessing. So he did not mention the name Abraham. But some features of the Abrahamic blessing are mentioned. For instance, blessed are the, those that bless you and cursed are those that curse you. Nevertheless, when he blesses Jacob right before he runs away to Haran, he mentions Abraham twice, which kind of indicates that by this time, he rethought the whole thing and said, hey, no matter how I wanted to, make my ways so that it would somehow fit God's ways as well, mm, you can do it like that. So he goes back to the way God spoke to him twice in chapter 26, where God mentions Abraham's name both times twice. So yes, Isaac was thwarting God's plan, Rebecca was also, to some degree, although she wanted to 
straighten it out. You know, one was twisting it, the other was straightening it. Question is, can you straighten God's plans out with twisted methods? And that's a good food for thought, you know, when you think, hey, this is not going well. Jacob should receive this blessing. We have to straighten things out. And then you have your twisted methods that you throw in there and mess it up even more. And Jacob himself. Now, we don't know exactly how much Jacob knew. We know Jacob was not very eager to get into trouble. He told uh, his mom, hey, my father will recognize me. He would curse me. So, yeah, Isaac was the probably main culprit because that's where everything started. But Rebecca is part of it. Jacob is part of it. And in a way, even Esau is part of it because everything started, this whole conflict started when Esau sold his uh, birthright for uh, a lentil soup. Why did God allow Rebekah to deceive Isaac? That's a very good question. Why does God allow somebody to deceive somebody else? Instead of going to him and telling him, Hey, sir, Lord, my Lord, my husband, Isaac, you know what the Lord told me. Probably because Isaac knew what the Lord told her. And since she did not go to tell him, at least the text doesn't indicate that, it can possibly be that she knew if she had gone to Isaac, it would have been uh, futile because Isaac would have not taken her opinion into consideration. That's a possible way of explaining it, but the text doesn't say, so the right answer is, I don't know. But that's a, that's a valid question. That normally, a wife and a husband, if they are on different positions, they should go to one another and discuss it instead of using the kids against one another, fooling one another using the kids. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all the lessons. And what interesting lessons we can learn. And through it all, we can see how you are in control. And al although you are not forcing our will, you are shaping history around us. And through it, you influence our lives in the right direction. We thank you so much in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen.